this is sacred space, libation. Instead of pouring water on the ground, I pour words on the page. I begin with this libation in honor of all those unknown and known spirits who surround us. I acknowledge the origins of this land where I am seated while writing this introduction. This land was inhabited by indigenous people, the very first people to inhabit this land, who lived here for thousands of years before the Europeans arrived and were unfortunately unable to cohabitate without dominating, enslaving, raping, terrorizing, stealing from, relocating, and murdering the millions of members of indigenous nations throughout Turtle Island, which is now known as North America. I write libation to those millions of indigenous women, men, and children, and those millions of kidnapped and enslaved African women, men, and children whose genocide, confiscated land, centuries of free labor, forced migration, traumatic memories of rape, and sweat, and tears, and blood make up the very fiber and foundation of all of the Americas and the Caribbean. And I wanted to spell that out. We're talking about from Alaska over to Canada, down to the United States, down to Central America and South America, to Chile and Argentina, that all of this land is um, occupied land and Africans worked a big, huge part of this land. So in, indigenous people and African enslaved folks, our blood is in the fiber along with many other communities. To paraphrase the late award-winning Black feminist writer and cultural worker, Tony K. Bambara, who was also my teacher, the mere fact that indigenous, Black, and other marginalized peoples are still breathing, and as we know, many of us are not, is cause for celebration. This is sacred space. When is the right time to talk about child sexual abuse? Even in our heightened contemporary awareness about sexual violence, we still do not talk about child sexual abuse, especially when it's happened in families. How does one initiate the public spaces um, in, uh, how does one initiate in public spaces the often silenced dialogues about any form of sexual violence, most especially child sexual abuse? How does one begin the conversation in the midst of the justifiable, righteous outrage? about the rampant and virulent racialized violence perpetuated against diasporic Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Arab, and South Asian people, undocumented immigrants, Muslims, transgender, intersex, gender non-binary, physically and mentally disabled people, deaf and hard of hearing people, and other marginalized people. How do we have these dialogues about sexual violence in the midst of the violence committed against our youth through our failing, underfunded, and militarized public schools, the school-to-prison pipeline, and the sexual abuse-to-prison pipeline, which is hoarding disproportionate numbers of Black and Latinx youth into the prison industrial complex? How do we have these conversations where there are currently two members of the United States Supreme Court who are known and alleged to have committed gendered sexual harm. I believe Anita Hill. I believe Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. Or when the President of the United States also a doer of sexual harm, harassment, and alleged sexual assault mocks rape survivors while his administration is doing almost everything it can to legally erase transgender people's existence, and by extension, I add intersex and gender non-binary people's existence. Everything that radical, disabled, deaf, and hard of hearing, able-bodied, cisgender, transgender, gender non-binary people of color, and anti-racist white people have fought and died for for over decades is being dismantled before our very eyes. We are in the midst of an inferno of human rights violations in the United States with global ramifications. Yet, if we continue to keep child sexual abuse on the back burner, this pandemic will remain there, barely addressed, while millions more children suffer silently. Sexual violence is pervasive and touches upon almost every single social justice issue, including, but not limited, to race, gender, gender identity, 
disability, sexuality, education, housing, immigration, healthcare, mass incarceration, militarization, and politics. This is sacred space. So that's part of the opening and then I, of the introduction, which opens the book. I wanna just briefly say that love with accountability comes from my own personal work with my family. I started demanding um, love with accountability of my um, divorced parents in response to their bystanding roles to my sexual abuse as a child. When I was 10, I was molested by my grandfather and I told my parents and I was not removed from the situation. And um, many, many years later, 2015 to be exact. So I was abused in 79. So into 45. So I was 10 when the abuse started and it wasn't until 46 when I really started saying love with accountability um, to my parents, basically saying that my love for them would not shield um, them from their accountability. It is. It has been a, a journey and a struggle um, with the three of us. Um, and I am happy to say that there has been resolution and accountability, but it's been a journey. As I said, this started at 10 and I'm now 51. And so I'm very grateful for all of the, the contributors for sharing their stories so deeply, their activism um, and, and, and work to disrupt and end um, child sexual abuse. And most of us, if not all of us are committed to doing this work without relying on the very systems that brutalize us. Um, and so the question becomes, how do we stop the harm without replicating the harm? And so with that shared, I will um, invite our first reader um, and contributor to please um, turn on your camera, Kenyette. Um, and I'm gonna read a brief bio. Um, Kenyette Tisha Barnes is a political strategist, lobbyist, public speaker, trainer, mother, and CEO of Nia Vizian, a social justice consulting and political strategy lobbying firm, and the national co-founder of the Mute R. Kelly campaign. I've had the opportunity to get to know Sister Kenyette through the virtual waves. And then Kenyette and I and Kalima and other sisters, we were honored uh, in 20, last year in 2019 for the Breakthrough um, Activist Awards. And so that was the first time when, well, actually, no, I met Kenyette at the um, March for Black Women, Black, uh, Black Women's Blueprint held their March for Black Women in September of 2018. That was when I met her in person and then reached out and said, hey, would you contribute to this anthology? And she immediately said yes. And she and Kenyette were among those who were like, had like less than a month to turn it around. And they, I mean, not Kenyette. Ken, Kenyette and Kalima were among those who had less than a month to turn it around when they did. Um, and so I will let you read your read from your excerpt and come okay. back afterwards. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? First of all. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much for having me. So my excerpt is this. Sometimes the wolves wear a lipstick and we call them auntie or mama or grandma or Miss Annie. I realized very early in my life that my girlness was coveted by those who wished to exploit, corrupt, break, or fuck it with impunity. I also learned many of us lived in a consistent, constant dissonance, knowing that men and boys only wanted one thing from you and that your worth was also based on the ability to keep a man. I learned that girls are not protected and that often the enablers of the sexual pathology of the black community were other, usually older, black women. I found that during my activism work, I tended to encounter one of two narratives surrounding black women and girls who've experienced sexual violence. They're either the product of bad parenting or they're simply are sexually precocious. Neither place responsibility on the predator and both often center toxic patriarchal misogyny war, shaming and blaming messages about how fucked up these girls and women were for allowing themselves to be raped. I accepted that, generally speaking, 
white people and white women in particular marginalize our race and black men marginalize our gender. Yet what made me most heart sick was the degree to which black women who were themselves often the victims of sexual abuse were also the enablers. Black women who were supported, who were supposed to protect, empathize with and support prepubescent girls instead often then not blame them for not having the social cognitive ability to navigate the pathological misogyny that they as full grown ass women themselves could not extricate themselves from. Older women in numerous cultures and countries across the African continent often held girls down while their clitorises were ripped from their bodies in the name of being acceptable to a man. The same man who would rape, malign, and abuse their torn little baby pussies with impunity. The church ladies who told the girls to wear longer skirts, yet closed the office door while the pastor was slipping under elongated hem lines. The same ones who sent pregnant girls away and snatched their babies from their arms as punishment for shaming the family while they told the boys to sow their oats. And if one woman won't, another will. Yes, older black women co-signed this shit because they are fucking wolves. For years, this was a conundrum that I struggled with. For me, this was the most difficult to deconstruct and analyze. I, like many black girls, had my psyche mutilated, was force fed a poison stew of stupid shit in the name of being a good woman. We were told to learn how to please a man sexually, but don't be too sexual. We were taught that sex is a duty and enjoying it makes you a hoe. You know, stupid shit. Always with the end goal of being some man's wife or booed up with some nigga who more than likely learned how to be a man from street pimps and hustlers. Black girls and young women were always at the bottom of the pile, grateful that someone would accept us despite the toxic sludge we had to shovel just to paint on a fake ass facade of happy. But you's married now and you better watch out because if you, won't, if you ain't pleasing your man, some other bitch will. Meanwhile, he's grooming your 12 year old daughter to be his next meal. And if that little hot ass little bitch fuck with my man. I remember learning that it's better to have a bad man than no man at all. I remember the assorted stories of those fast ass girls who only wanted to seduce good men away from their good women by the same women who understood that men will be men. And I'm going to, I'm going to skip this a little bit. This misguided dogma has created a space in which black girls and women have no allies. We are pitted against each other by a toxic patriarchy which seeks to feast on the young and our own mothers, our supposed sistren, many of whom were themselves harmed by this same shit, set pious, self-righteous in judgment, served us up to be slaughtered and feasted upon by ancient niggas who these same women called husbands. And that was an excerpt from Sometimes the Wolves Wear Lipstick and We Call Them Auntie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kenya. Thank you. So I wanted to I think that this, this is, is such a powerful, every essay is powerful. Um, I appreciate this essay because you, you really um, call out or invite in older uh, Black women, speaking as one myself now, <laughs> in terms of what are the messages that we tell young people, specifically young girls and femmes, in terms of how, how to move in the world um, and how we blame them. And just would love for you to talk about that more and, 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 and especially in connection with your um, incredible work around uh, uh, the National Mute R. Kelly campaign. Thank you so much. So I am um, also a survivor um, and it took me years to realize that what happened to me was abuse. It was rape. It was sexual violence because we were taught that 
rape is some guy jumping out of uh, behind bushes and slashing your throat and forcing you into this and that in some way you are physically harmed. Mine wasn't. My abuse happened at the hands of a 35 millimeter camera. And I think the thing for me, as far as the work around Mutar Kelly, was that child pornography and electronic medium rape was the central kind of method that his behavior became known to the public. So why the essay sort of touched my heart. So I was asked by someone who read the book, you know, was this my story? And I am fortunate to say that it wasn't. Um, I had a mother who in her way protected me from that, um, was very much, um, you know, nurturing and really, you know, made me understand that any man old enough to be your father has no good in your life and that you have to look out for the other girl. So my mother really helped me with that. But unfortunately, with most of us, our experiences are not, they don't stop with our parents. Um, I had, you know, aunts and aunts, aunts and friends and older, you know, people who kind of put those, those things in your head. Um, one of the things that really touched my heart and made me write this essay was some of the experiences I had with the Mutar Kelly campaign. Um, when the campaign started, I almost naively thought that black women, black women would support this. They, they understood. We, we know um, that over 60% of us are survivors of sexual violence before our 18th birthday. We know these things. We, we've lived this life. We, we are survivors of this pathology, yet I found more vitriol, um, harassment, abuse, um, threats from black women. And these were mostly older black women um, who felt that these young girls deserved it, that, you know, 13 year old girls have the mental capacity to negotiate a sexual encounter with a predatory adult man. Um, I, I encountered a lot of adultification and um, I felt like, you know, talking to friends of mine who unfortunately did not have the nurturing mother I had and did hear these horrible messages and this lack of protection and this idea that they are precocious and the church girls who got pregnant by the preacher's son, but the preacher's son is a good guy and she is, you know, the temptress or, you know, the, the 13 year old girls blamed for their own sexual abuse. You know, I, for a long time I worked in public health and one of the things that I did as a statistician is I looked at um, state data and then I had to kind of analyze it. And one data base I looked at was uh, vital statistics. And when I saw lower age ranges of pregnancies, so this is 13 and under, I think the, the youngest age range that was recorded that I saw was 11. Um, the girls, the, the case, inevitably had a, um, a child protective service um, case assigned to it. So when we're seeing very young pregnancies, these pregnancies are occurring because of rape, but instead we change the narrative and we blame the girl and we, you know, why are you out there having sex at 13? Well, that's not the case. So um, I don't want to kind of, you know, yeah. I can go on about this forever, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, you, you, I mean, we can talk about this some more, but I think it's important to understand that predators in our community exist, but they're also enabled, and unfortunately, a lot of our enablers are older women. Thank you, and we will, all of us will talk about this and more at, at the end, so thank you, Kenyette. All right, so you. Um, Rosa, if you will please turn on your camera. And um, so, oh, we're switching, sorry, thank you, switching interpreters, all right. So, um, Rosa Cabrera is a queer Afro-Dominicana single mommy living in Oakland, California, unceded Olone land 
In 2017, Rosa founded Root, reclaiming our own transcendence to address interpersonal and sexual violence using healing justice and community accountability models. She teaches English at Shabbat College, engaging a Black feminist framework in content and practice. And just really the work that Rosa is doing in, in the Bay Area, um, with Root in terms of these workshops, um, series, really in, in utilizing transformative justice in response to harm. Um, and, and so holding folks accountable and, and, and just not only around sexual violence, but also around white supremacy. So Rosa will read from her chapter and then I'll come back. Thank you, Rosa. You're on mute. Okay. I also want to invite folks to just take a deep breath between these reads because, because yeah, we have bodies that need care. Um, okay, so I'm going to start from 161. Throughout my youth, I was angry with my dad for so often gaining my trust only to break it. After beating my ass, he would ignore me for days until he broke ice with the offer of money or anything else I might want to buy, but not an apology, never an apology. Still, he would regain my trust over and over again because I wanted him to love me. And I would blame my mom for letting him humiliate her, for letting him hit me and having my siblings and all walk on eggshells so as not to ruffle his feathers. Why didn't she clap back? Why didn't she grab his hands? She was an adult, just like he was. Why did she let him scare her? Nevertheless, my mama demonstrated love for me in different ways. She caressed my head in the dark, spoke to me with clarity but compassion when I acted selfishly and cried when she read my runaway letters. Because of her emotional perceptiveness, it was easier to place blame on her than to demand an apology from my father. I saw my father as a threat, a tender proof wall. On the other hand, my mother was safe, accessible. Through this dynamic, a hierarchy was maintained and it didn't just make my brother, my sister, my mama or me more susceptible to harm. It also made us susceptible to blaming each other and we did for the harm my father perpetuated. This dynamic also brought me the furthest away from the language I needed and the closest to shame when realizing I had lost my virginity before I fully understood what virginity was. But even as I watched him emotionally brutalize my mom and physically hurt me, I wouldn't believe that he would try to end my mother's life. I thought that was a boundary he would not cross. I justified my own disbelief. I told myself and her that she was paranoid and I'm sorry, that she was paranoid or so distraught by my dad's abuse that it was causing her to see and feel things that weren't real. Imagine that, abuse, causing someone to imagine abuse. On numerous occasions, she mentioned to me the time she saw my dad following her in public and hiding behind cars, walls, and bus stops. I thought, my dad is a jerk, an asshole, but he wouldn't do something as goofy as stalk my mom his own wife, despite the fact that he would verbally shit on her in front of her kids. He was so steadfast in his ability to control others that he frequently reminded my sister and me that he owned our bodies, our belongings. So I couldn't imagine him ducking and diving from any of us. It wasn't until I turned away, I'm sorry, it wasn't until I turned 20 that I believed her, not because I learned how to become a better advocate for my mom, but because I caught him in the act. Um, I'm gonna skip over to 163. Aggressors sometimes won't believe the level of harm their actions are causing survivors. Their gaslighting and denial is sometimes a product of an unwillingness to see the abhorrent within, them, within themselves. Like bystanders, both those who actually witnessed the abuse and those whom survivors open up to, Aggressors are frightened of the possible level of torment and harm they cause survivors. Like bystanders, they place blame on victims. Phrases like, I didn't hit you that hard and you provoked it are common messages fabricated to cope with the possibility of being a monster. 
my dad always used to tell me and still tells me, I'm always going to have conflict in my life. I talk back too much. I don't respect authority. He once told me that I would end up with a lover that would hit me because of that attitude of mine. Necia, comparona, sinvergüenza, our mouths are filled with rhetoric whose purpose is to silence survivors and normalize abusive behavior, not by calling it abuse, and similarly not accurately describing resistance to that abuse when it happens. We are expected to be still as children and never outgrow that stillness. Nope, I don't sit quiet when I'm forced to accept actions against my own well-being. Yep, I move with rage when I'm cornered by power. And yes, I did date a lover for two years who both literally and figuratively pushed me, cut me, and made me bleed. But fortunately, unlike my mother, after finally understanding the situation I was in, I had the material resources and emotional capacity to leave. My resistance to and distaste for injustice against myself is not the cause of my conflict. For my father to absolve others of behaviors like his own is to uphold his own innocence. This is easy for him to believe because he's echoing the rhetoric that bounced around the Dominican Republic when he was a child and was, con and was confirmed by American patriarchy when he was an adult. This is how to uphold abuse. We justify it, validate it, create coded language around it and even reward it because we're scared of acknowledging the ways we enact and enable it in any situation that would turn us into monsters. Thank you, Rosa. <clears throat> <sighs> yes, deep breath. <laughs> so I would I would uh, thank you again for this piece. And all of them are pieces, and I say P-E-A-C-E -E when I say peace. When the title, where does the title fear of believing survivors comes from? Come from? Um, where, how was that title born? Okay, um, so I, I wrote this piece um, sometime after the whole, you know, Juno Diaz um, situation unearthed. Um, and for folks that might not know, um, this is, Juno Diaz is a, a, a Dominican writer um, who has, uh, he has had many survivors come out and, and say that he had, you know, crossed some boundaries. And um, there were a camp of folks uh, within the uh, Latino and Afro-Latino community um, who, um, protected Juno uh, Diaz's uh, image or kind of supported him. And, um, and this was after he wrote an essay uh, talking, uh, exploring his own survivorship. Um, and many other folks felt that, his, that in his essay, he minimized the impact um, that he had on other women that he had harmed. Um, so there was some folks within the um, Latino community and the writing community that um, supported, you know, survivors. Um, and it just, you know, made me think, I, I didn't respond, I didn't, I, I took some time before writing a piece around this, and when I got to writing, it wasn't about him, it was about just the, the, the culture of violence, you know, that we live in, and, um, and I think more recently, like this is kind of hitting home for me too, I think recently we've been seeing a lot of like calling out happening um, and I think the danger of kind of seeing the problem as this thing that exists out there, um, it removes the self from the issue, right? It, and the fear of believing survivors sometimes is um, when we feel some kind of kinship to the person that it caused harm or there's some kind of um, something in that person that caused harm that, remind us of, that reminds us of us. Um, somebody that we hold dear to, um, it becomes scary to believe survivors because then we would have to look within ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, we would have to ask some serious questions around how did I enable, you know, the harm that this person had caused or um, this person is so much like me, um, 
why, uh, how is it possible that this person caused harm, right? Um, so I think the fear of believing survivors um, is really around the fear of seeing the self as a person that has the capacity, you know, to cause harm when the person, you know, that is being identified as the aggressor um, may look, act, feel, and talk so much like, you know, the self, right? Um, and yeah, and my, and my, my feelings around this and calling out, you know, I, yes, there is a need to, to bring voice to um, situations where um, survivors have been silenced, especially in situations where survivors have asked for accountability and that ask has not been responded to um, with full responsibility um, and with seriousness. And at the same time, I feel like there's a need to have a whole community call out. It's not just an individual call out because when harm happens, it's not just about, you know, that one individual, there's a world um, that surrounds that person that gets called out um, where there were, you know, things were said, things were done, things were witnessed that were not questioned. Right. And oftentimes survivors have, you know, tried to find language. And I talk about, you know, language in this piece um, that have never had the language to speak out that don't, um, where in, in fact, the language that surrounds survivors is a language of violence, right? Um, and I think, you know, Kenyatta kind of, you know, spoke on that, how survivors kind of co-sign, you know, and um, enable, you know, harm. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, the, the signaling, you know, that happens around us. Yeah, thank you. And I think it, it, it also, I mean, and I'm gonna, um, um, bring the next speaker on uh, reader, but one of the things that I was thinking about Juno Diaz when you brought him up, he's, I mean, a many, many examples, but that perfect example of what happens when the harm causes harm, right? Like, so he clearly was harmed. That doesn't condone his harm, but how do we handle and deal with all of the harm, right? So there's the most immediate harm, but then most people who are, who harm others have been harmed. And so how do we create that the space where the folks are held accountable and then they also get the help in, that they need as well as the current survivor who's been harmed. Right. And then also like the institutions that are affording um, people in power with power, what needs to shift in, you know, these organizations, you know, these people that uplift, you know, people that cause harm. It's so easy for communities to just kind of wash their hands clean when they throw people away, but then they don't do the shift that then makes it possible for harm to um, not happen, right, to be avoided, right. right? So we think that, you know, the call out and the, the push out is, is the problem is solved, um, but that's not actually the case. The action to think that way actually continues to put us in a vulnerable position and continues to open door for more harm to happen. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Rosa. You're welcome. So I will bring Workia up. We'll see you in after everyone reads. Workia. <clears throat> oh yes, thank you. Dr. Workia Duncan is an educator of over 20 years and currently serves as the head of upper school and director of equity and engagement at the Cathedral School of St. Um, John the Divine. Um, I believe I met you uh, through uh, Danielle Moss, um, mm -hmm. who participated yesterday, who's also a contributor. Um, and you know, when I asked her to contribute, she said, oh, I know someone else who might contribute. So thank you. Um, and um, really think it's, it's so, I mean, there's just such a wide range of contributors, but as someone who's working in education, really look forward to definitely hearing your um, excerpt from your your book, uh, from your uh, chapter, but then also in terms of the work. So I will let you read and then I'll, I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. Whew. Okay, here we go. Six. That's how old I was. Six. A super tiny and very sure of myself. Six. All of that changed right before my seventh birthday. Every day after school, I would go to my mom's job, which was housed in a church, my church. I sat in the stairwell, did my homework, and read a book. This was my schedule, like clockwork. What I didn't know was that someone else was paying very close attention to my schedule. 
and it wasn't my mom. He was young, exuding kindness in our previous interactions, and I thought, harmless. I didn't know what grooming was, but I guess that's what he'd been doing in the months prior. I remember when it started. I was wearing my school uniform, and my hair had a red bow in it. I was reading Charlotte's Web. I know that's not a book a six-year-old would typically read, but I didn't grow up in a typical household. At any rate, I was reading, and he started to touch my knee. I didn't say anything, and to this day, I still don't know why. Then he began to touch my thigh, and again, I said nothing. I was six and grew up in church, and you don't talk back to your elders, even when what they're doing feels wrong. Then, his fingers moved further up and pushed my panties aside. He inserted two fingers and I finally made a sound. It hurt. I didn't even know I had a hole there until him. He removed his fingers and when he heard me wince, smelled them and went about his business. He would do this every day until right before my eighth birthday. The way I grew up, bad things happened to people whose faith had wavered or to people who committed a horrible sin. I didn't know which applied to me, but I knew I had to have done something awful for God to allow this to happen to me over and over and over. When I was 14, I found out that he died of AIDS a few years before. I sat in torment because back then there was little we knew about HIV or AIDS. I was convinced I contracted it. I said nothing to anyone, including my mother, until I was 16 years old. I told someone in my church because I figured if the assault happened in church, maybe I could get healing in church too. That was a mistake. I remember being in a youth group gathering one Saturday, and when someone said a particular word, all of the snippets of memory combined into a flood. Whereas through the years I remembered some of what I'd experienced, a single word seemed to make several years worth of assault come to the front of my mind, like a record on repeat. I began crying and screaming uncontrollably. They went into spontaneous prayer because that's what we were taught to do. When I finally calmed down, the leaders asked me what was wrong. I told them what had happened to me and their response ripped the band-aid that had been placed over my gaping wound only to pour salt on it. They quoted Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. They said my being molested as a child was equally bad and necessary to make me a symbol of what God could do. They said my emotional turmoil was all part of the process and that one day I'd see that. What I thought would begin my healing threw me into pain that for a 16 year old was unmanageable. What I needed to hear was that God and someone else cared. I knew I'd never receive any legal justice. After all, he was dead. But I needed my church to say something different to me. For centuries, black women have been expected to hold up the church whether through financial contributions, service, or both. Who's holding up these women? Who's singing their songs? Love with accountability in the church looks like churches being safe spaces for crying, screaming, and cursing, and even not believing, if that's part of the journey. Ooh, let's take a breath. Thank you. <clears throat> I, we, so I, <laughs> sorry, I and mean, I've read, I read every, all the chapters before today, I mean, before this set, our webinar, um, one of the things that we don't talk about enough is the role in which religion plays in condoning sexual violence, the church, the mosque, the, you know, how, how this, where we come to look for salvation, for caring, where, as you said, just so eloquently, they're pouring salt on the wound. 
Um, and I mean, just who's holding people accountable. Um, and um, are you doing work in with churches around this issue or, or no, or? Not at all. And I think that's why um, the title is Unfinished. Um, I still have so many problems with churchiness and church, even though my default is still very much that church. I'm still um, part of one right now, but I, I feel like, I feel like they did me a disservice. I feel like they didn't care. I feel like my kids are not safe in church. Um, they stopped wanting to go to Sunday school because of it. And I was okay with it. I was completely okay with it because I, they saw the, the hypocrisy earlier than I did. And they wanted to make sure that um, they got answers right away between what they were reading and what they saw in the world and what preachers were saying. Um, so, I mean, Sundays we'll still watch church, but the religiosity with which I grew up is definitely no longer present. Um, I see myself as more spiritual now. Um, I don't know where that lands me. I know that I, I have not felt safe in church uh, since I was six. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. And you're grown and a mom of four. Yeah, exactly. And that's part of it. I think it was because like, I, I understand the whole genderedness and that, you know, when kids are born, the doctor will be like, it's a boy, it's a girl, it's whatever. Um, and I remember when I found out that I was having a daughter, I was terrified and I was angry um, because I didn't know how to protect her or I thought I didn't know how to protect her. And I also realized that I didn't even think about that where my sons were concerned and that that was equally problematic. And so I started to have full conversations um, that to some might have seemed inappropriate, um, but I feel like letting them know what happened to me would give them a lens to see if they were being groomed and didn't even realize it. Um, and so it's, that's pretty much where I am now. Yeah. With and just briefly in terms of your work as an educator, um, what are ways in which you, you see in terms of, I mean, not only in terms of churches or school or just children being abused and then coming to school, you know, in terms of those safe spaces? Um, so I remember before where I am working now, when I was working in um, a public school, there was a boy that just seemed really, like there was one day he seemed really joyful. And then over the course of a few weeks, something just changed in him. And I remember just sitting down next to him and asking, you know, had he eaten? Were his parents okay? Were his siblings okay? And he started shaking. Um, and he started like just trying to hold himself. And before he told me what happened, I knew what had happened to him. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I'm, I'm hypersensitive around young children, knowing of course it can happen to older people, but I'm very conscious of who's around them and how they're relating to them um, so that I can kind of be the go-between if necessary because I already feel like my body was broken and you can't break it that much more. So I can be that go between if necessary. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you, Workia. Yeah. Thank you. So I will um, bring on uh, Kalima and we'll see you shortly. And take it. We're going to switch um, interpreters. Okay. Hello, my sister Kalima. So read hello. your <laughs> Hello, hello. So uh, Kalima Johnson is a clinical social worker and lead consultant for Soul Healing Consulting, LLC. She is the executive director of SASHA, and that stands for Sexual Assault 
services for holistic healing and awareness center. She's so it's a Shasta Center, a nonprofit sexual assault agency in Detroit, Michigan. She is a past professor of social work at Mary Grove College and lead expert on relationship safety and management for the NBA. Known Sister Kalima for a long time and she was literally the last person I asked. And I was just like, I got three weeks, girl. Can you do it? And she did. And she did it with power. Her essay um, in the anthology is on turning 50. And so looking forward to hearing you read and then engaging with you afterwards. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone else who've, who's read already. I just really feel so honored to be uh, amongst such great writers and, and people who are breaking silence in all kinds of new ways. I'm gonna read from page 222. I believe one of the main reasons I can express empathy in the context of everything is that I made a conscious decision to also remember that my cousin is a breathing human being, a black woman, mother, sister, cousin, helper, lover, and collection of what I call and both. I committed to not allow child sexual abuse to control my life and fuel my anger. I used my creativity to fill my day and deliberately chose love for myself and others in spite of what I endured. This is my story. I am not saying or suggesting that I did what I did for myself and for my cousin is a good idea for anyone. I will say that I am in a much better place. I believe she is too. It took years of work, cursing and tears, wet beds and drama, counseling and creativity, poems and songs, candles and sage. Therefore, before I move on to share how my early life trauma of sex child sexual abuse has formed and structured my beautiful, complicated, yet simple and loving life that taught me healing, justice and reconciliation, I must thank my cousin. I thank her for the many times she cornrowed my hair in beautiful, intricate styles beat that girl's ass on the block for trying to feed me a shit sandwich and introduced me to good music, leotards, and homemade Halloween costumes. She birthed the best second cousins ever, whom I love like my own. Just recently, after I let folks know I had been hospitalized through a group text that included our entire family, she responded by telling people to stop group text messaging. When I saw that response, it made me smile a little. While I know this is complicated at best, I will say that I would rather be free and able to smile because of her than hold us both down in some dark gutter because of the numerous traumas we both faced and endured as children. In that text message to the whole family, my cousin, she said, and I quote, my cousin said, stop texting in this group message. She busy healing right now. And to that, I say, I hope that, it sh that she is healing too. Amen, ashe, and boom shakalaka. My healing has been directly and indirectly tied to my life's work and purpose. The trauma of child sexual abuse put me at risk and I was raped again at the age of 15 and then again at the age of 19. They were both committed by young men. One rape happened on a date and the other was committed by a so-called boyfriend. The cops were called after my rape when I was 15 years old. Their response was horrible. As the report was being filed, the words escaped me. After I had told my mother what had happened, I was unable to describe the sexual assault to the cops. The white cop told my mother, who was only trying to help me, to sit down and be quiet. My little sister, then four years old, spoke up and with terror in her voice began pleading with my mother to please stop talking. In response, my mother snapped. What I witnessed was not the familiar schizophrenic snap I had observed from this intelligent woman, but it was the kind of snap you expect from a hard working black woman protector of her children. That's when the black officer took me outside to get the story from me away from my mother. The white cop apologized and stayed with my mother to explain to her why she needed to be silent during the report. Before giving me the opportunity to gather myself, the black cop inquired, stop before you even start again, young lady, where's your father? 
You were raped because you don't have a daddy. I was done, silenced, debilitated, and no longer wanted, felt, or believed I needed their help. These horrific experiences set the stage for radical forgiveness and my commitment to addressing sexual assault, childhood sexual abuse, and trauma in the Black community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the, um, there were several things that um, I, I would uh, like to ask you to speak about briefly is, um, this is definitely talking about sexual violence when the harm doer is not male and you're a female, because I think so often, I mean, we've talked about this, people uh, think that sexual violence is only men committing violence against women and girls, and we don't think about the violence that women commit against other women or that men commit against other men or boys. And if you could, you know, just touch on that, please. Absolutely. Um, that was uh, my first recollections and memories of being sexually assaulted was by my female cousin. And I kept it a secret for a very, very long time. Um, she is about 10 years older than me. And it came out when I was working on an assignment trying to become a social worker. And they asked us to do an assignment where we had to identify the, you know, substance abuse in our family, child sexual abuse in the family. Uh, missing people in the family, all kinds of stuff. And my mother was helping me with the assignment. And my mother said to me, because I had to ask, well, mama, who's been molested? Because at that point I hadn't shared. And I was in my 20s, early 20s, because I was going to keep that secret. And my mother said, well, you know, your cousin was molested by her mother's boyfriend. Okay. And I said, and before I could gather myself, I said, that's why she was molesting me. And my mother said, what did you say? And I say, oh, I did, it came out. Yeah, she was molesting me too. And my mother said, why didn't you tell me? And I said, I didn't know what to say. And, and the only reason why she had access to us was my mother was schizophrenic. And there was time when she, times when she had episodes that her sister had to take care of us and that's when I was hurt. And my mother told me at that very moment how powerless she felt hearing that story and how it was breaking her heart. And it happened to be her favorite niece, by the way. It wasn't anything my mother wouldn't do for her. And it just, it just for me, and, and I will tell you now between me and my cousin, I forgave her. I chose to remember the beautiful things that I shared in the writing about who we are together. I found it in myself to give her the compassion that I wanted and needed myself because she was being hurt at the time. Uh, she was old enough to know right from wrong, but she definitely was being hurt at the time. Um, our family is still split as a result of it because she's still around and pretty much uh, up in age and more like a matriarch in the family, uh, whether she signs up for it or not. Um, and I even asked her to write this with me. I don't know if you recall me telling you. Yeah. I said, and I said, I'm gonna give her a chance because I'm about to put her whole shit on blast. So let me just give her a chance and tell her side of the story. And I called her. And one of the first things she said is that, uh, and we had already talked about these things. I had already, you know, I had confronted her shortly after that whole assignment I had with my mom and with, at school. And uh, it took her a while to take any accountability. And the best she could do is say, I did what I knew. And then later on, during other nondescript times, she would say, I'm, I'm sorry, or she would check in on me, or she would take up for me, like she had always done. I mean, she literally, beat the shit out of that girl down the street for trying to feed me a shit sandwich, you know? Um, and I had a conversation with her and we've had ongoing conversations. And I said, listen, about this book, I want you to tell your side of the story because she journals a lot. She has, she has these journals, everybody wait, we see. Um, and I said, I know you can write and I know you have written, you know, so, you know, can we do this together? And she just said that she would think about it. She didn't sound like she would do it. And then eventually she told me no. And I said, one thing you need to know is I'm not gonna ever let you forget what you did to me. I'm not gonna ever let you forget it. I said, but I also know that our relationship is complicated and that there is love there and I will not ignore that love between us because we're family, but not just because we're family, 
but because I, you're a human being and, and what happened to you wasn't your fault. She paid for it. I mean, I've seen her go through so much in life that I don't even feel a need to have revenge or anything like that. Um, but I told her, I said, I'm gonna write this. And if you want to see it, I'll let you know it's coming out next October. I said, but I'm writing it because it's my story. and You're not going to take it from me. But I also recognize that holding her in a gutter, I, I would be right there with her. And that's just something I can't do. And I have moments and I tell her, there's some days I can deal with you and some days I can't deal with you at all. And you're going to have to accept that. And she says, okay, She's, she does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's ongoing work. Don't get me wrong. It's right. And, and, and I'm I worth it. And we're worth it. And I think what's powerful about what everyone is sharing is that I think that people have these notions of if you're running a center, if you're teaching, if you're le leading a movement, that we don't have trauma as well. Like there's this notion of, you know, in order, because we're able to do some of this stuff that we also still aren't healing. And so I think that that's what's powerful because the Sasha Center does incredible uh, work for survivors in, in Detroit and beyond, but in definitely in Detroit. And yet- We concentrate on black women, you know? Right. And, 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 and so another assumption that folks make is that because we're so open and out with our stories that they can just drop our stories on us at any time to get us to do what they think we, we should be doing. And it's like, no, you don't get to drop my story. I, I drop my story when I'm ready to drop it. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, that's part of my healing too, the work and the connection. And I appreciate you and everybody on this call. I really do. Yes. Well, thank you, Kalima. And we'll see you after we hear from Ferenc and Sister Loretta. So, Ferenc, if you will please turn on your camera and mic. Hi. Hey. Hello, hello. So, I'll read your brief bio. Um, Ferenc Lafarge, PhD, is a writer, educator, and consultant with nearly 20 years of experience in secondary and higher ed institutions. He is the author of the memoir, Songs in the Key of My Life. His writings have appeared in such venues as 215 Mag, America's Quarterly, The Huffington Post, Next American City, Social Science Research Council, and Social Text Periscope. I had the opportunity to know, meet, um, and, and work with uh, Ferenc when we were uh, both at Williams College in 2016. Um, so that is when that marked the beginning of our one-to-one -one in person connection and I at that point the anthology was a, an online forum and um, when um, I purchased his memoir and read it I was like oh definitely wanted to have him contribute to the forum and then when the forum became an anthology have him in the anthology because we don't hear a lot from um, male survivors of child sexual abuse and especially black male survivors so I will let you read from your 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 excerpt and then I'll come back thank you and thank you again for inviting um, on moving forward One of the many conversations with my editor prior to the publication of my 2007 memoir, Songs in the Key of My Life, that sticks out is an exchange about what the book's publication might mean for the person who sexually assaulted me when I was a child. Although I had not yet shared what I was thinking, as the public disclosure of my status as a survivor of childhood sexual assault neared, I had begun visualizing how my memoir debut might facilitate getting justice against my assailant. Visions of court deliberations and depositions with lawyers began persistently loitering in my mind. In these dreams, the assailant and I were on equal footing, and I was forced to consider whether I was prepared to go forward with facing him for the first time in two decades. Then just as swiftly as the possibility had overtaken my life, it disappeared when my editor reminded me that fewer than 3% of sexual assault, sexual abusers are ever imprisoned. While I had long been aware of this statistic, for some reason I thought that at this point in my life, the outcome might be different. After all, I was no longer a child hoping someone would believe me. I was now an adult, a well-educated professional. I thought my word would be as good as his. Years later, I still think back to that moment not just a conversation with my editor, but rather that moment in time when I had steeled myself for the inevitable pivot toward justice 
and my assailant being held accountable for his abuse. The questions conjured by my recollections of this period are essentially the same ones that I have asked, that I have when asked about contributing to love with accountability. What does accountability look like when tackling child sexual abuse? Can we have accountability around child sexual abuse without punitive justice? What does restorative and transformative justice look like to you? Accountability looks like healthy families and communities. Accountability does not begin after any abuse has been perpetrated, but rather before anything happens. For example, I remember looking on in awe a few years ago as a friend spoke to her toddler daughter about not letting people touch her unwillingly. More to the point, I was taken aback by how deliberate she was using the word vagina. Later, when I asked her about this exchange with her daughter, she told me that being frank in reference to her child's body was one of the steps she was taking towards stemming the long history of child sexual abuse that had long infested her family. My partner and I are similarly direct with our children, making sure to refer to their body parts by their correct names. We refrain from indirect or infantilizing references to their bodies. For example, we do not tell the boys to clean their wee-wees in the shower. Instead, it is wash your penis. By modeling for them that we are not afraid of discussing their bodies, we are empowering them with templates to do the same. Therefore, in treating them as sole proprietors of their bodies, we are helping them frame their interactions with others around their bodies so that they may be better equipped to fend off would-be abusers. That said, parenting strategies aren't foolproof, nor does the existence of sexual abuse indicate family failings. The intersection of personal and social responsibility in this matter is particularly fraught in the larger part because there is a greater struggle to, to effectively articulate and acknowledge that sexual predators are in our midst and in some cases in our own homes. And not unlike other areas of the criminal justice system, what constitutes a transgression worthy of being included in a sex offender's registry is wildly inconsistent. Thank you, Florence. <clears throat> I really um, appreciate the, the work that you and your partner are doing. And I know um, Markia had, had discussed this and I know Rosa's doing this um, and I'm, Sure, Kenyatta is doing this in terms of parenting um, with the next generation and empowering um, young people to um, know and be able to speak their body parts and 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 just also have body autonomy. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, you don't talk about this in the anthology, but I, I'm very uh, would love if you would just share what what created the space for you to break your silence in your memoir about. Um, the the your child sexual abuse um a, a series of things um uh i really started doing that the work of um coming forward when i was a graduate student it was the first time that um i entered um therapy um i it was an opportunity to look deeply in terms of not only how the abuse had affected me as an individual but also played a role or still really um, um, defined relationships. Um, um, I was, I took a certain level of solace about being open with it, about it with girlfriends and um, anyone who I was intimate with. But even then, um, I didn't really, it, it was clear, like once I began getting mental health counseling, that, um, that there was more to that. Simply telling um, a few people was not enough. And I had to really do some close work in terms of really thinking through um, what it meant to be a survivor um, and what it meant to kind of move forward with that work. The other thing is I knew that, um, you know, this was not something to be ashamed of. And as a person who was wrote personal essays, uh, who's always writing, written personal essays, that was one of the few things that I'd never written about. 
Um, so if I was not ashamed of it, um, why not write about it and why not be open? Um, and it was a way of opening up the space so that, um, you know, as, you know, eventually now, as my children get older, um, it's something that I can be open with them about as well. And also it provides different facets to sometimes the mentoring and community work um, that I do. Um, it gives, it allows me to be frank at times um, with people when I might disclose why I'm empathetic to their situation. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you mentioned in, uh, in your, your chapters, you talk about um, some of the reasons why people don't disclose in terms of, and I'm thinking about tr transformative justice in the criminal justice system, that what would it look like if, if people knew that disclosing didn't automatically mean, you know, child protective services or incarceration, um, and just would like if you could just touch on that some in terms of how to respond to, to CSA <clears throat> in ways that, you know, definitely stop the abuse from happening and center and centering no, um, centering um, people who've been immediately harmed, but also, but just not replicating these kind of systems of crime and punishment and, you know, just uh, this, the sense of that people are just irreparable. Right. The, the punishment piece is really key for children. I think um, one of the, one of the things that really holds um, children back from coming forward is a fear of having families being separated. Um, it's one of the it's one of the first times that I find a lot of times when talking, when even now I just think about my own experiences talking to other survivors that we really entered into this adult world where we really started thinking about not only just uh, about protecting or uh, defending ourselves, but we became um, really cognizant about defending the, our abusers or, or our families, right? Um, and so in order to protect children and really create a, a system of justice around this, we actually have to um, create systems that don't automatically um, ha have children feel as if they're going to be impaired um, and that their families are going to be dissolved if they come forward. Um, so it's about working with schools. Um, it's about working with um, community-based organizations. Um, it's about expanding, expanding the access to both, and it's not simply mental and emotional health, I think overall um, social services so that children and families can come forward and that uh, the abusers um, can also find help and support um, that they need um, in order um, to stop what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ferenc. So I will bring up Loretta Ross and then call everyone up after Loretta reads. And we're gonna switch interpreters. Um, thank you, Nicole and Yolanta. So I'll read uh, um, Loretta's bio who, Loretta Ross is, uh, and these are my words, trailblazing and pioneering black feminist who started her career in the women's movement in the 70s, 1970s. She worked at the DC Rape Crisis Center, the National Organization for Women, the National Black Women's Health Project, the Center for Democratic Renewal, the National Center for Human Rights Education, and Sister Song, Women of Color Reproductive Justice until retiring in 2012 and then she resumed life after retirement, and now she's teaching and is a visiting uh, associate professor at Smith College. In 1994, Loretta co-created The Theory of Reproductive Justice, and she's co-edited and co-authored Reproductive Justice, an Introduction, Reproductive Justice Foundations, Theory, Practice, Critique, and Undivided Rights, Women of Color Organizing for Reproductive Rights. I've had the pleasure of knowing, learning from um, being in sisterhood, intergenerational sisterhood with Loretta since the 90s. She's featured in my film, Know the Rape Documentary. And so it's just such an honor to have her included 
in um, the uh, Love with Accountability Anthology. And I always remember one line that she says in Know the Rape documentary, in order to do rape prevention, we had to do sex education. So I will let Loretta read from her chapter and then come back. So well, thank you, Aisha, for that wonderful introduction. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can okay, hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, my life experiences propelled me into the anti-rape movement. And I used the movement to make sense of my life experiences because I was raped when I was 11 from a Girl Scout outing. I experienced incest from an older cousin at 14. He made me pregnant, so I had a baby at 15 out of incest. When I, my first year at college at 16, I was gang raped. And then a few years later, 23, I was sterilized. So I had a bunch of experiences that in and of themselves are dramatic and traumatic, but I wouldn't forego any of those experiences because I had to decide that my trauma didn't define me. Although it did grow very deep crevices in my mind, and it's too easy to slip into depression because of these experiences. So I fight these patterns every day. And each day, I think I'm stronger with the victory. I had to decide that my spirit is my boss, not my mind, not my body, or the men who left their dirty fingerprints on my life story. At the Rape Crisis Center, I learned how invaluable professional therapy is in helping me stay present in my life because I was seeking to, to escape my lived experiences through drugs and sex work when I was a teenager. And it was the other sisters at the Rape Crisis Center that helped me understand that sexual, fighting sexual violence and reproductive oppression could fuel my activism. And I've learned that activism is the art of making my life matter. And for the past 40 years, when I've told this story, either in small gatherings or in national media, other women come up to me and say thanks because I've opened the gates for them to tell their story and find the courage to speak out. And I, whenever Black women speak out, I think we're awed by the result. This self-confidence and feminist analysis that I developed at the Rape Crisis Center came crashing to a halt a few years ago at a family reunion. <clears throat> my 40-year-old niece, one of my 40 nieces and nephews, by the way, secret, secretly revealed that one of my brothers had committed, in, <clears throat> excuse me, committed incest against her when she was 12. I think I need some water. And I was shocked because I was not expecting the story about my most beloved brother. I'm one of, I have five brothers. So I told her to confront her father and let him know that the secret was out, at least to her and me. And she did, she was very brave. She took him outside and talked to him. And I knew her story was true when my brother came back into the family reunion and then avoided me for the next two days which was not his usual behavior. Another one of my brothers asked me why my whole attitude had changed about the family reunion and I told him, but he doubted his truth because it painted a picture of a elder brother neither of us could recognize. I didn't know what to do next besides talking to my niece I'm from a family of elderly women and my fondest fam fantasy is to finally be able to sit at the big kitchen table with all the older elder women, you know, who are, who, well, the, you know, young family members run around and wait on us. But since I'm still mobile in my 60s, I'm still the step and fetch it girl for the older ones. <laughs> so I haven't quite grown up. But this day I needed to sit at that kitchen table and ask my elders for advice because I had to figure out how I could be there for my niece in a way people had been there for me nearly five decades before. 
I want to end this continuing cycle of childhood sexual abuse in my family, but I don't know how. My siblings are grandparents, sometimes great grandparents, babysitting our children. How can we protect the vulnerable children we're so proud of? And I want my brother to be held accountable, but I had no idea what that would mean because he's dying of prostate cancer. And I expect every family reunion to be his life because his last because his body is shrinking so fast. He's in chronic agony. And I wanted to shout out my knowledge, but I didn't know what it would do to my family. I still don't know. My, my late mother was also an incest survivor from age eight to 16 until she married to escape an abusive uncle who lived with her in a multi-generational farmhouse in central Texas during the depression. She actually chose, not, chose to not go to college because going to college would have meant continuing to live with this abusive uncle and she got married instead. And so sitting at that kitchen table, I wondered if my great uncle had also abused her sisters who were sitting at that table with me or the cousins. I mean, did I even have the courage or the right to pull off the scabs from their wounds when these women were in their 80s and 90s? And if I don't speak up, then do I join the conspiracy of silence? in which the men we deeply love continue to have sexual access to inexperienced girls in my family. My older cousin raped me and my father felt impotent because he couldn't retaliate when this cousin flew overseas to escape being accountable. But they may be good men who do bad things. Does that make them bad men or complex people predictably acting out distorted masculinities. And so I ended up spending the last four decades co-parenting with my rapist because I kept that child born of incest. He was my joy. And my son knew this history and he tried to build a positive relationship with his father, but that of course failed very predictably. So now I'm asking myself, what is our responsibility as elders? Do other nonviolent men in the family get a pass? If not, what is their responsibility in breaking the silence and maintaining our family love? I should add, why was there such a patriarchal difference between what the girls in my family knew about childhood sexual abuse because we experienced it and all the boys in our family who are denying not only that it happens, but they don't even know how to hold each other accountable or have these conversations. But I do know that excessive sheltering of our girls and the insistence on the respectability politics of Christianity didn't shield my mother, it didn't shield me, and it certainly didn't shield my niece. And mom used to say, tell the truth and shame the devil. And this advice seemed right until I became the one caught up in the hinge of accountability. What I didn't know what to do. Because fighting childhood sexual abuse doesn't seem so black and white as I thought my feminist principle urged me to do. When you center family love, family healing, and family unity in the frame, it compromises my determination, at least, to uproot this festering canker hidden in the center of our relationship. Fortunately, my, before I could even figure out what I wanted to do, my niece asked me to stay silent because she was not ready for her story to be more public. At best, this was a temporary reprieve because her father babysits his granddaughters. It's just a postponement. And so the secrets of childhood sexual abuse of females in Black families, we can call it the legacy of enslavement or the emasculation of Black men by white supremacy are even dismissed as the politics of gender entitlement and see our black men as failed patriarchs. But this pervasive rape culture that normalizes and celebrates violence against women must end. That, is that it? That's you, it. Okay. I'm not sure if that was 
I, I went over time. Or no, I, I wasn't. I, please, I was just listening. <laughs> <laughs> so much. It's so, it, it's, um, I think about your forthcoming book, Calling in the Call Out Culture. I mean, Rosa spoke about it earlier and just those complexities where, I mean, because I, where are things to the extent that you want to share, able to share, where are things now on this issue as your niece come more public is it more public or I mean you're public obviously with the at your chapter um on in terms of addressing it or has, is it just kind of moving forward well I don't know how to define how public I am okay because for 40 years my family has studiously ignored all of my feminist activists because so, they always thought I was just the wild rebel child who wasn't churched who they didn't have to pay a lot of attention to, but it did cause a real uh, conflict in the family when my niece told her story and then one of my brothers, who wasn't the abuser, by the way, but wanted to defend the abuser, decided that he was going to try to push me out of the family. Not the niece, but he said that all you do is profit from telling the bad stories about our family to support your feminist career. Mm -hmm. I don't know where this money hungry kid thinks being a feminist is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that is like, okay. I know for, you know, I've only known him for 65 years. So he's always seen everything as a transactional money based thing. That's kind of, he was the kid that I grew up with that would, you know, keep his nickel and borrow money from you to keep his nickel. So I knew <laughs> who he was in terms of money. But I wasn't expecting him to be more angry at me than the brother who committed the incest. And we've actually made up, hugged and kissed and talked and everything. Mm. And so I probably got in a lot of trouble and he's probably unforgivably mad at me because his rage was so disproportional because he wasn't the one I was that was being accused that I asked him if there was something about the way he raised his daughters that I should know. I mean, because this was just, you were just too incandescently angry when the person who did it is in a totally different place and you're still carrying on. Now, I have to say, he. He's not capable of kicking me out of the family. I mean, my family roots go back to 1844 on a plantation in Selma. <laughs> I mean, really, kid. And so I have many connections to many other family members. And what's interesting, since the murder of George Floyd, my family are on Facebook competing on how woke they are now. So they're constantly sending me links to videos or books they think I should read or things that they thought, and this is my totally apolitical family is suddenly waking up and trying to enter these racial justice conversations in a different way. But I suspect that only my sister who died in March mm -hmm. uh, ever read my books, ever watched my YouTube videos. She, she used to call me every time a new one came out and you know giggle with delight because she was so proud of me. She was my older sister. She was nine years older than me and all, and in fact, my mother. And, uh, but the rest of my family don't, have never known what to do with me. Mm -hmm. And um, this, me, me telling the story publicly for the last 40 years hasn't helped. But I would suspect that the estrangement started because I just didn't embrace that evangelical Christianity that is their bedrock. And I left the church at 14, so. I've always been an odd one out. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly talk about your, your forthcoming book, uh, Calling in the Call Out Culture? I saw, um, yeah. Or just the word, it doesn't have to be about the book, just the work. I mean, following up and, and then I'll you know, bring everyone on, on camera, but just because as you heard in the beginning, Rosa was talking about that as well, you know, this, this call out culture. Well, because I'm so technologically <laughs> incompetent, I did not notice the call out culture until about five years ago, because I was not on social media. And then once I got on it, I was really appalled 
at the way people felt the right to say just anything they wanted to say and their inability to not comment on everything on their social media feed. And so I had to ask young people, what is this? Are y'all always like this? And she said, oh, you mean the call out culture? I was like, yeah, y'all named it? She said, oh yeah. I said, well, what are y'all doing about it? And she said, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is just how we are. And I began to review my activist years, which you know, back in the 70s, we would call it sectarianism when everybody had a different black liberation theory and used to fight with people over it. And then that wasn't even about the Marxists who fought with the, with the socialists and the on and on and on. And then living in Atlanta, I've had a lovely and extensive conversations with the civil rights movement. And I need to stop and pay tribute to Reverend C.T. Vivian, who died on Friday. He was my boss for five years at the Center for Democratic Renewal, National Anti-Klan Network, and his funeral was today, so I have to bring him into this conversation. But he talked, he told me all about how all the fights between he and John Lewis and Ralph David Abernathy and Dr. King and Joseph Lowry, I mean, they fought too, but they knew how to present a united front at those strategic times it was necessary. And so it's not like people haven't called out. I mean, the original definition of calling out is dueling, in which like Alexander Hamilton got killed. I mean, calling out is what humans do. We make judgments and, and that. But right now, I think the calling out culture and the cancel culture, which accompanies it, is damaging our ability to fight fascism because there's all of this horizontal hostility towards each other instead of a strategic solidarity to take on the fascists. Mm -hmm. And I get criticized for calling out the calling out culture. I co-signed a letter in Harper's a couple of weeks ago about the calling out culture. And of course, everybody that didn't like that letter. First, they pointed out to me something I already knew that I'm fat. <laughs> and then, you know, the ad hominem attacks just prefe you know, prefaced everything they were going to say bad about why am I defense of the call? Why am I uh, calling out the calling out culture? Isn't that what Trump is using? And blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I started writing my book before Trump even got, became president. I mean, this is something that's damaging the human rights movement. And we need to be accountable for it because we can't tell the difference between an enemy and a problematic ally. And our poor ass threat assessment means that we're going to be remain the divided and the conquered. Thank you. So I would, I'd like to ask all of the contributors to um, please come back, turn on your cameras and mute your microphones unless you're actually speaking just so we don't have cross currents and wanted to invite um, any of you if you want to follow up or share um, something I have I mean I have a lot of questions but I want you all to engage as well um, they're not there are a lot of com like amen and Ashen comments powerful comments in the chats but there haven't been like specific questions but if they're you know want to if you all want to engage with each other ask questions please let's let this be the moment and if you don't, I got my question. <laughs> I do want to ask you, uh, Kalima, to please talk about the model, the triangulation model. Um, I just think that that's so important. Oh, thank you so much. Actually, um, the Black Women's Triangulation of Rape um, was a model that we came up with about three years ago. And uh, it didn't get uh, much recognition until after we started Mutant R. Kelly. And actually, <laughs> with a girl. And then um, when R. Kelly came out, I had the, the, the pleasure of watching it uh, premiere with the producer of the first documentary, uh, Dream Hampton. And she said, is your model ready? I said, my model is ready. She said, well, this is Surviving R. Kelly is trending, tweet it. And I don't know how to tweet. We had two Twitter pages. My interns was handling that. And I was struggling, like how to tweet. And thank God for uh, uh, an MC who lives here in Detroit. She was there 
um, they were there too. And they were like, just give me your phone. And I did. And she tweeted the model and then it got retweeted 8,000 8, times. But what we really decided to do is we weren't trying to be academic about this at all. We were very grassroots about it. Let's draw an infogram or in infogram or graphic, if you will, that would explain why it's so difficult for Black women to reach out for help, why it's so difficult for mainstream organizations to provide services to Black women, and why it's so hard for community to even understand when Black women say they've been sexually assaulted that they actually need some kind of intervention. Um, and basically, we just kind of broke down all kinds of things from the adultification of Black women and girls to um, Moya Bailey's um, uh, whole misogynoir and we talked about uh, the Jezebel and we talked about uh, the notion of black women not having ownership of the bodies and it just really resonated with everybody and more specifically I was motivated to do the model and get people around the table to talk to me about it and all kinds of people from my hair clients to and some of my hair clients are in the sex industry and they gave us feedback and and it's just everybody I didn't I didn't and it's a live document like we can change that thing you add and make it better um but my goal was to really show a picture of how difficult it is for us to find funding that's appropriate to be able to provide services for ourselves that is appropriate that speak to us um and you know just to remind black women that they have had so much placed on their shoulders around healing and integration um that we needed a picture of it like this is what it is if you're struggling this is what it is if you uh, feel like you have to be silent, this is what it is. If you feel like you got to tear up the whole damn barbecue, this is what it is. Uh, and we don't apologize for any of it. We just got to look at it for what it is and try to problem solve from there and provide opportunities for Black women to have their voice in the way they need to have it uh, so that they can begin to integrate this traumatic experience. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Rosa, I would like for you to if you would just talk about the work that you're doing with root um and and you know i've talked about it a little bit but you need to i i can't talk about it in the way in which you can please mm -hmm. so um uh the work that i'm doing with root reclaiming our own transcendence um the the project that we're most focused on right now is a a nine-week um healing workshop um, that started specifically for people that had caused harm, that um, we're looking for spaces to address some of the underlying, you know, issues. Um, and part of this work was created because survivors um, wanted two things from people that had caused them harm. And they wanted uh, people that caused them harm to address or to acknowledge the harm that was caused and to stop causing harm. And I, we were looking for resources within the Bay Area um, for that to be possible. And um, we found that in the Bay Area, a lot of the healing programs or programs that address um, harm were either tied to um, the court system, the system of injustice, um, or there were programs, you know, out there or support groups out there that were not very culturally, you know, relevant to the um, by POC community out here. Um, and so I teamed up with Amy Paulson of Gratitude Alliance, who does um, collective democratic somatic healing um, in communities that have been deeply impacted by war and trauma. Um, I pulled her over with um, Anton Olivier, who um, is an elder in the community, has been teaching um, youth in the Bay Area for 46 plus year expressive arts. Um, and we came together and created this curriculum that we call a sacred curriculum, a curriculum that engaged like us consulting with you know, our ancestors and we literally felt them in the room as we were creating this. Um, and in 2018, um, I think we've done th three cohorts of this and we're doing our fourth and fifth cohort simultaneously right now. Um, it's, it's been such a magnificent journey. Um, it is, I think, the only, and I'm not, you know, you can kind of go to our website and, and see what other people have said about this work, but um, I, I feel like I haven't seen work that has been as sustainable as this. And I think that speaks to um, the power of collective healing, right? Um, and, I, and I feel that part of this work is building a model for practicing accountability before harm even happens, right? Um, how do we talk about some of 
um, the deep seated traumas that we don't know how to name that we don't know how to identify that we haven't been able to map, you know, in our bodies that the patterns of um, speaking to ourselves, um, relating to others, seeing ourselves in the world that are so deeply embedded in our society and so deeply embedded in our bodies that we don't even know to question it. We don't even, we don't know what our work is. So the, the workshop is really, a lot of it is this, um, is investigating the self, um, investigating each other, learning how to um, communicate with each other in ways that may feel, you know, unfamiliar, but we're trying, we're practicing, we're doing the work um, within the circle. And then part of that work um, over the nine weeks is we also train um, to let participants to then lead the work. And some of our facilitators currently um, initially have come to us as participants and are now also co-facilitating um, the work as well. Um, and it's work that has changed me as well. I, I admit when I first started this organization, I was not yet the person that um, I needed to be to lead this work. Um, the work itself changed me um, and has helped me see the ways that I've also caused harm um, in community, um, ways that I've been unable to map, you know, um, um, traumas that, you know, have occurred throughout my childhood up to, you know, my adulthood. And um, yeah, I, I feel like it, it's, um, it's something that um, we are also very excited to give to other communities to lead. We're working on a guidebook right now um, to um, share with, you know, other folks that want to lead this work. Um, as well, you know, because some we can't train everybody, you know, um, and sometimes we're not the right people um, that need to facilitate this in other communities. You know, there are other folks that already have been doing the work of, you know, leadership and organizing and healing, and so we just want to like provide um, additional tools, you know, to that. And I feel like this um, work is different in that it's you know less kind of um, theory based less kind of, um, it's less hierarchical, it's less um, thinking or thought-based and more um, trying to access language that um, perhaps is difficult to access using, you know, spoken language, especially when harm happens in a time of our lives where, you know, we don't have language, you know, pre-verbal harm, right? And so a lot of the work is very hands-on experiential. It's a lot different than sitting in a room and having somebody talk to you um, or PowerPoints, you know, and all of that. It's very, it's a different experience. I don't know if there's something specific that you wanted me to say. No, about I just wanted you to just yeah. share, you know, just give for yeah. people to know. And I, I meant to let everyone and all the attendees know that I've cr created, there's everyone will receive information, contact information, as well as mm -hmm. list of books, the link to Kalima's um, triangulation, Mute R. Kelly campaign, all of all this information will be emailed, um, um, as well as a link to this video um, at a, a later time. And I wanted to, um, oh, Yolanta, do we need to change interpreters or are you and Nicole okay? Okay. Um, ask, uh, uh, can yet where are things now with uh, the mute R. Kelly campaign? Okay, hi. Uh, so am I still muted? Well, you're here. We hear you. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, um, so it's a long it's a long answer. So let me try this. So um, first, I understand and I reconcile and my co-founder and I have had this conversation since the beginning that the idea of accountability, the idea of kind of forced accountability for some is sort of counter to the long goal, the long goal of liberation. And I get that. And we struggle with that. And, but one of the questions we asked ourselves before we decided to really do mute R. Kelly, understanding what that verb meant, um, is we had to ask ourselves this question. Um, do we do something about it? Do we address it? Do we almost have to force um, this man to look at his behavior? Or do we just allow more young black girls 
to be sexually cannibalized while we find nice flowery language to basically um, make excuses for the behavior. I mean, as a black woman, I don't know of a black woman who has not experienced some degree of sexual violence. I just don't. Um, and, and I'm talking from eight to 80. And I believe that one of the problems in our community when it comes to sexual violence is we are afraid to call out cancel music or whatever. And in, in kind of internalizing that fear, we do nothing. So one of the things that we were really clear about when we entered into this was how do we strategically do this and still understand those intersectional, intricate issues of the harm done to white supremacy and the misuse of masculinity. And how do we understand all of that and then go into this and realize that these young ladies were victims. Um, one thing I said is that if R. Kelly was a white man or those girls were white girls, this would have been over years ago. The fact that he was a black man with power and statue and we have our beliefs about that in the community and that these were black girls and we understand that black girls are adultified, they are less protected and more preyed upon, that it was simply a perfect storm. So I say all that to say, uh, what's next with Mutar Kelly? So right now we are trying to, um, to make space for the survivors. Um, however we might feel about the criminal justice system, uh, he currently is detained in Chicago at a federal holding facility. What will happen with that, we don't know. Um, I have, my, my campaign and I have been very strategic so that we are not subpoenaed at any time for testimony. So that was one thing that we consistently did because I don't wanna be a part of testifying because I do struggle with walking that tightrope. And I want that part of it to be left up to the people who are far smarter than me. So back to what we're doing. We are holding space for those survivors. Um, the young ladies that were featured in the documentary, the young ladies, several, there were several documentaries. Um, these young ladies are constantly being harassed. They're being doxxed, they're being threatened. And this is what we don't talk about. I mean, when you do speak up about these things, you, you literally walk around with a target on your back. Um, we make space for them. We use our social media platforms to consistently talk about sexual violence, especially in the black community. We, um, we make space for other um, grassroots activists who wanna do this work, but there really isn't a good template for this. So we make space for that as well. But as far as what's next, um, we don't really have a good answer for that. I mean, we are, we're currently talking about it. Um, that we have some ideas of what we're going to do with this. So I'm just going to have to say stay tuned at this point. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's so complicated. And, you know, and I think that as, as survivors of color that we're, we're, we're confronted with that all, you know, the, the criminal injustice system, community, right. all of that, that we have to hold all that while also holding our, our trauma, you know, I mean, it's all trauma, but that is, is definitely, um, that's part of, of, of this, of this work of standing at the intersections. So I, I just want to open it up at Loretta Ferenc, okay, if you have something to say, please offer follow up thoughts reflections of Kalima, if you want to. <laughs> yeah. No? Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm going to add, okay, Loretta, I have to ask you um, in terms of, you know, you, you talked about being in this movement for and doing this work, what, since, you know, the 70s and one of the third directors of the Rape Crisis Center. I, I just, I mean, I've heard you talk about this, but I would love for you to share just in terms of the the men who who wrote the rape crisis center in terms of the the men in, in prison and and the work that they were doing and exploring you know the consciousness raising because so often as i've learned 
over and over again. A lot of times well, what we think is new in the 21st century has been done before it's, it's had a different iteration. So if you would share some of that, please. Yeah, uh, the DC Rape Crisis Center where I was as third executive director had received a letter from a group of black men incarcerated at Lorton, which was DC's penitentiary out in rural Virginia. And one of the authors was William Fuller, and he said, outside I raped women, inside I raped men, and I'd like not to be a rapist anymore. Hmm. And William was no one's victim because he was the biggest, buffest, baddest boy in the prison. He was the pre he was the perpetrator in the prison, as well as having raped and murdered a black woman when he was like 17 and the person he murdered was 16. But by the time he wrote that letter, he was in his mid-30s. He taught himself to read. He somehow got hold of some Black feminist literature, probably the Kumbahi River Collective. I'm not quite sure what caused him to write us. But we sat on that letter for a long time because we barely had enough resources for the victims of male violence. And we were also building a lot of male victims on our hotline because at the time, older boys raping younger boys was part of the gang initiation that was taking place in Washington, D.C. So somehow, some months between five and 10% of our hotline calls were boys. And so we were busy trying to broaden the scope of services we could provide. At the same time, here's a perpetrator saying, hey, I need help. And so we didn't immediately respond to William Fuller. It took a long time for us to figure it out. But finally we did. And of course we had to set a lot of conditions. We're not gonna be the mules for anything you think you need while you're incarcerated. No cigarettes, no drugs, no tennis shoes, no letters to mama, none of that. If you think you're gonna use us, to make being incarcerated for raping and murdering black women any easier. That ain't happening. <laughs> but if you want knowledge, we'll offer it. And so we started a black feminist class for them. And they went on to organize Prisoners Against Rape, PAR, which was the first male-led anti-violence program in the country from their place of incarceration. And I think they started PAR in 1974. At least that's the first uh, when I look at the research and try to look at the first letters and stuff they were writing, 74 is the earliest I can date the, the, the evidence. Mm -hmm. And it was transformative for them and it was transformative for me because I'd never shared mutually with men who had been raped my story of being raped. And it humanized them for me in a way that I was not expecting. Mm. Uh, if anybody, you know, I talk about calling in now and I keep saying, if we could call in rapists and murderers in the 1970s, how come we can't call somebody in that uses the wrong damn gender pronoun now? I mean, what are we doing? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, how do we lose that ability? to still see the humanity of everybody. And so a film was eventually made about prisoners against rape. I'll just close this long, overly long story with one thing I never expected to see because these men were serving life sentences. So we felt pretty safe that we would never encounter them on the street and I was wrong. When I'm walking down the street of Washington DC about 20 years later and I hear this Loretta Ross, Loretta Ross, and here's William Fuller walking down the street towards me, scaring me to death because I never expected to see him out. But William, he did rehabilitate himself. He, like I said, he was a leader. He was a natural born leader and one of the smartest people I've met. And he had gotten married, got a job in construction, was reconstructing his life. He was very proud that black feminist theory helped him become a better man. And I was proud that I played a small role in it. Yes, that's beautiful. Thank you for that, that story. I think that we, 
we talk, society talks about people as monsters and I definitely think people commit monstrous acts, but I do believe people, as, as someone said, Janelle Wright in, in, in Know the Right documentary, if, if people want to change and then are given the tools now, you can't just like want to change and not have them change. So thank you for that. Well, I also want to bring up what Mia Minka says in Transformative Justice, because it's accountability has to be first taking ownership of the harm that you did, being accountable for that harm, offering to repair the harm, and figuring out a pathway to behave differently in the future. A lot of people want forgiveness without taking all of those steps. And I think Black people are too easy to offer forgiveness without all of those steps being taken. And so... <laughs> that, and that's what the church is always, forgive, forget, except unless you're, you right. know... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so there's a science to accountability that I'm very happy to see emerging in the restorative and, and transformative justice movements. But let's be clear. A couple of kids down the block from me shot off their guns, and I ended up with a bullet fragment in my yard, you know, which was kind of scary. But I'm not going to knock on that kid's door and ask him for a session on transformative justice right now. So <laughs> we still got a long way to go. Yeah, we do have a long way to go, but that's the work. That is the work. So with the, with the last like three minutes, if there's anyone who has a burning desire to say anything before we close out, just so grateful for all of you, for your contributions and for your, your work in the world. Um, it's it's uh, all of you, the work that you do as, as educators, as activists, as advocates. Um, it's, it's really powerful and just really deeply grateful for your willingness to share your stories um, in this anthology. Because as we know, when we share, you know, we, sh we share it once, but then every time somebody encounters it, it's being shared again and again and again. So you all have kind of, as long as this book is in print, put yourselves out there in perpetuity. And I, I thank you. I just want to say thank you as well. <laughs> thank you so much. It's just an honor to be uh, in the anthology and honored that you pulled it together. I'm so glad you asked at the last minute. I ain't kidding. You could ask me three days before it was due. I was going to come up with something. Uh, but I just want to say I'm inspired by each and every one of you. And Loretta, I haven't seen you since I was in my 30s, I believe, at, with the Michigan Coalition. Oh my uh, God. And you set it on fire back then and you still set it on fire now. And I'm so thankful for you. Keep on, keep on. If there's anything you need, you let me know. Uh, show me how to use the internet. <laughs> <laughs> when COVID's over, I come and spend a night and show you everything. Just, just, I just love to be in your presence. Your energy radiates throughout the whole space, even in virtual. Your energy radiates. Thank you. I want to share just a, a Loretta Ross story. In, in, in the 90s, when I was making no and struggling, and I didn't have any money, and I was filming across the country, and when we interviewed her in that house that she is in now, such a lovely home, um, Loretta said, you know, I don't, I don't have money, but I have frequent flyer miles. And so she gave me enough miles to pay for two tickets, which was for the director of photography, Joan Brandon, and the assistant camera, Gail Lloyd. And the three of us flew out to the first color of violence conference, um, held by Insight in at Santa Cruz. And it was there that we did filming there. So just in terms of that intergenerational, you know, sister is a, a verb and a noun in the words of Tony K. Bambara, then, and, and, and recently in earlier this year Loretta threw another life raft so it's just in terms of and I and I've experienced that with Kalima and you know there's just all these ways in which you know it's not just about you know the um the actual kind of theoretical work but it is also about the the embodied practice of of of, of black feminisms in all in its broadest range so thank you thank you all well, I'm going to say one last thing we have some slamming Friday night conversation and cocktail parties among a real bad black feminist posse. And if you have a network, do that, sister. Start yourselves a virtual cocktail party so that you can replenish what you're so busy giving out. Oh, it it is what I do. I look forward to it. I didn't drink this much when I was a teenager. But every <laughs> Friday night, I'm getting drunk and crunk with these old women. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll have some sparkling water, but yeah. <laughs> so.
So as I've said, I will be emailing out the contact information links um, so people can contact people, access the materials and information about a lot of things um, discussed here, as well as the link to the video. So and thank you to the interpreters, uh, Nicole Schumberger and Yolanta Galloway. Thank you, Dr. Rokia Duncan, Kalima Johnson, Rosa Cabrera, Kenyette Tisha Barnes, Loretta Ross, and Ferenc Lafargue. Thank you all. Love with accountability. Oh, yes. And Sheila Alexander-Reed, the tech, my beloved partner, who's holding it down and giving me instruction. So thank you. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. Bye.